Hey everyone, Gaijin here. Yeah, sorry this has taken me like two and a half weeks to get a new video out. The last week and a half has just been freaking bonkers. So first of all, I had to get my very first COVID vaccine done, and I did have a few side effects from that, and that knocked me out for a good couple of days. And then immediately after that, I had to take my wife to go get her freaking shot done, and that knocked her out for another day, and I needed to keep an eye on her to make sure she was okay. So that was like half my week gone. And then after that, I needed to get the pilot out of my brand new spinoff series, Yokai Hunter's Rise, which is an amalgamation of my Yokai Hunter series and Monster Hunter Rise over on my main channel. And I guess you can probably figure out what all that's about. So if that sounds interesting, be sure to go check that out. But yeah, I am absolutely completely caught up and I finally, finally, finally wanted to get to these community questions because I know it's been weeks since you guys have sent these. And because of that, I have 29 pages of questions and counting. Not just 29 questions, 29 pages and counting. I think I got maybe a third to a half of the way done and... I'll get it to as many as I can. I promise you I'll get to as many as I can. Uh, I will say this though, a couple of these I did have to skip, either because they're too subjective, or they would need their entire new video, or they were just kind of inappropriate. So again, I'll answer what I can, and yeah, here we go. This is the community Q&A, Gaijin perspective of, well, what was life like for me in Japan? So first question, what is the scariest thing that happened somewhat commonly to tourists in Japan, and what is the scariest thing that happened to you when you were in Japan? I mean, you gotta understand, Japan is one of, if not the safest countries in the entire world, so there's not a lot that's really all that scary. Uh, I will say that at first it was really kind of scary living next to a Yakuza house, but again, after like a week, I realized that, oh, they just work on their cars and do their own thing. They didn't even address me. I will say, though, that I was actually kind of spooked. There was a time, I think I've told the story before, I'll tell it again. I was in the process of going to a party like this or like like this get together for jets the jet program it was all the jets in the area coming together i had to cut through the red light district of of yokaichi i mean it was fine but it's like you're going to a red light district and the funniest thing there was a dude in a suit outside of an establishment and i think it was a pink salon i'm not sure and uh he just like just gest just gestures me to come inside and i'm just like mm -hmm. i didn't even say anything i'm just like this and i just immediately turn to left turn left and left <laughs> but i think aside from that the only times i've ever been scared was when i was like surprised and that actually happened a couple of times when i was visiting the last time i was in japan one of the most odd i guess is i was just at a vending machine like a jito han biking right i was just getting i was just putting in my money i was i was getting my drink i reached out to get my drink and all of a sudden behind me i hear this I, I wish i was kidding but that's what i heard and it was this dude, he was old, he was either low income or homeless, and, and he was he was riding a bike, and you gotta understand, we're on this kind of narrow pathway, and there's it's like us, we're here, and then there's this small rail over here, and then there's a street, right? And so he's trying to weave by us, and all of a sudden I back up a little bit, I have to back up to bend over to get my drink, right? And so I just, I just hear this, Ugh! and then he looks at me like, and I'm like, dude, you have a you have a bell or a horn on your bike. You should anyway. This is the one thing. I'm, tangent time. This is the one thing that drives me absolutely crazy between people in Tokyo and people in Yokohama. People in Yokohama they ring their bells all the time. Uh, for me, as an American in the beginning, I thought it was like a rude thing because I equate like a car horn or something like that to being like, "Hey, get out of the way." It's kind of an insult, but in Yokohama, it's like, "Hey, I'm coming. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful." And so I'm just looking back, and I'm like, "Oh, okay. I'm just gonna get out the way here." In Tokyo, nobody does that. Everybody just dodges and weaves like in in like uh, people traffic, in a crowds and stuff, and I hate it. <laughs> Because it scares me every time and this dude this dude was just barreling through right like right behind me just oh! <laughs> Anyway Enough of that. Let's move on. So next question What is the best way for tourists in Japan to be respectful or at least what not to do and I will remind everyone of the time-honored classic Do as the Romans do be observant watch what other people in Japan are doing and basically do that case in point uh, escalators Depending on if you're in the Kansai or the Kanto, people will either uh, ride an escalator on the right side and then go up the left, or on the left side and then go up the right. So basically, in order to avoid confusion, you just follow what everyone else is doing. It works wonders. Japan is a society where everyone just kind of does the same thing. I, I don't mean that in like a, an interpersonal way. I mean that in just like a, a just like movement. 
everyone follows traffic. Like, the one thing that, that is really, really cool about uh, my wife, Aki, is that she has horrible, horrible, like, she gets really, really bad anxiety attacks when she's around a lot of people, but she's never had an anxiety attack, really, uh, in Japan, except for when we were in Nagoya. More on that later. And I ask her, why is that? And she's like, because everyone's so organized. It's like, traffic of people may be high, but everyone's going in one direction. As far as general things that I could say that we as Westerners have a propensity to do, do not be loud. I know that I'm very loud in these videos, but when I'm in Japan, I try very, very hard to be more quiet. Especially if you were on a train, bullet train or otherwise, don't talk. At all. Unless it's like an emergency, or and if you need to talk to someone else, just like 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 lean in and whisper something like that. Or if you're trying to talk to someone who's across from you, you just kind of like lean forward and, and talk to them that way. I I, I remember I've, I've gotten in more trouble in Japan for being loud than anything else, and that's just again it's my natural propensity as a Westerner. But yeah, just just don't do that. Okay, next question: Should all three alphabets be needed for learning Japanese? Do people call themselves by surnames unless close to each other, or is it an anime cliche? All three should be needed uh especially like you're gonna need for one you're gonna need all three if you're gonna be any good at japanese you're gonna need all three you're gonna need hiragana katakana and kanji uh, but as far as are all three needed at this point i would say so there are so many words with only so many um phonetic sounds that i can't help but feel like if, if kanji didn't exist especially because japanese doesn't use subject heavy sentence structure so it could be very, very difficult to tell what is actually being talked about in a lot of cases. So for kanji to be like people, places, things like proper nouns and things like that, it's really important. Uh, and then for katakana to exist, yeah, I still think that that's kind of important too. Because when you re when you see katakana, you realize that, that this is a loan word or this is a bad word or this is a foreign word or something like that. So then you actually have a moment to switch your brain into like, okay, I need to pronounce this or read this as like English or something like that, not as Japanese. I hate the process. I absolutely hate the process, but I mean, it just kind of has to be there. And then as far as the people calling themselves their surnames, I mean, San is just normal. Uh, even amongst relatively close friends, like dare dare san, like person person san, like name name san, whatever, that actually happens more often than not. I think it, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's kind of neutral. It's like a neutral, polite kind of thing. Nobody calls themselves by a suffix unless they're really, really cocky, uh, which you do see in anime sometimes. But no, as far as like, if you're talking slice of life or like a high school anime kind of thing, like that that is san, like, yeah, that's pretty normal. Absolutely. Okay, next question. What is your favorite Japanese historical figure or one that you think had a very interesting life? The Demon King of the Sixth Heaven, Oda Nobunaga himself, man. One of the most hated men in Japan, one of the most cruel and power-hungry leaders to have ever existed. Yet there is so much about this man that I can actually respect. Barring all the murdering of, of men, women, and children. I mean, you know. But it, the, the thing of the matter is, is that Oda Nobunaga was many things that a lot of leaders in Japan were not. He was an innovator. He looked at new weapons, new tech, new ways of fighting, and incorporated that into how he fought. One of the reasons why he did so well, because he was an innovator. Second reason why, he was a risk taker. The Battle of Oke Hazama, where he was going up against the uh, Imegawa clan and the Matsudaira, like both of those clans together, it was like 3,000 against 30,000. It was an odds of 10 to 1, and he crushed the Imegawa. <laughs> He took risks. He took calculated risks, though. That was also important. And then finally, he saw people for what their potential was versus what their bloodline or their family or their lineage was. That's almost unheard of at that at, at that period of Japan. You know, I, I know a lot of you are thinking it. I'm thinking it, too. I'm thinking Yasuke. And, and don't worry. I did see the trailer for that anime coming out, and I will be making an entire video here based on my thoughts and opinions on that. But, I mean, you look at Yasuke. Yasuke was just, he, like, he was a Jesuit slave, for lack of a better way to put it. And Oda Nobunaga looked at him and said, I see some potential in you. Either because, and, and we don't really know specifically why. Granted, the dude was like seven feet tall and absolutely jacked. And I'm sure Nobunaga looked at that and was like, you're a big, tall, strong dude. I want you on my side. But he didn't treat him like a slave. You know, he gave him a proper position. He made him a retainer. You know, got him a house, a sword, like money things like that so there are a lot of things about oda nobunaga that you know are bad but there are lots of things in my opinion about him that make him actually a better leader 
than either Iesu Tokugawa or uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Again, we'll get into that in, in another video, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, next one. Based on your personal experience in Japan, how would you say the mindset of the younger generations differ or are similar to the mindset of the previous generations on uh, social issues in Japan? Well, it's kind of interesting because I'm seeing great wonderful things and truly tragic things at the same time. Uh, on one hand, kids don't care about, about anything abroad. Uh, it was actually something that I talked to my team teachers about literally 10 years ago, is that while all of the t teachers that I team taught with loved the idea of going abroad, like people in that generation loved the idea of going abroad, that is not the case so much anymore. Uh, and I could tell with my own kids. They just did not care that much. Now, I might be wrong. I There may be more people in Japan now more than ever who want to travel. Uh, maybe to places like uh, Germany. I don't know. Maybe maybe a lot more European countries. But um, I, I don't think there's that, that same spark as there once was 10, 20 years ago. But on the other, other hand, a lot of these youngsters in Japan really are pushing for, like, reform. You know, they... They are trying to figure out and fix Japan's ongoing problems, which is something that I really do appreciate. Well, there are so many younger people in the workplace that are trying to change how things happen in the workplace. The other thing, too, that I'm noticing, entrepreneurship in Japan is actually on the rise, which is really interesting. Because you don't hear that much about entrepreneurship in Japan. It's... It is the goal to basically go become a salaryman and work for someone else. So for someone to work for themselves at great, great risk, because I'm sorry, Japan's not that much of a of a, of a business risk taker, uh, it, it really is interesting because that is the ultimate risk. And I'm seeing a lot of people succeeding, which is really, really great. But on the other, other hand, so many young people in Japan do not care about politics. Now, I get it. Politics kind of suck. They're complicated. They're rife with corruption. But you can't fix anything until you get politicians in to vote out the bad stuff and bring in the good stuff. And one of the things that I've always noticed about Japan is that people really are detached from politics. And despite the fact that so many young people want these social issues to be changed or relieved or fixed or whatever, they're not putting people in office in order to make that happen. So it's, it's, it's tragic in a... In a very real sort of way. Okay, next question. I guess my biggest question would be advice for experiencing other cultures where you're at. Also, how did you get your Japanese food slash snack fix in the US? Well, I get it now from Boxu, who have sponsored my other content, so I'll just quickly worm in here. Go check out Boxu, they're really, really good. They're not paying me to say this. <laughs> but luckily for me, I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area. It's a big area. Uh, but there are so many Asian markets around. We've got H Mart, we've got uh, Ranch 96, or no, Ranch 99, sorry, weird name. Uh, and then we also have the Mitsuwa Marketplace, very, very close from us. So it's like, we've got Japanese, we have Taiwanese, I think, um, and then we have Korean. Just, just like massive market, so I, I get my fix easy. As far as experiencing other cultures where you're at, like... For me, one of my biggest regrets when I was living in Japan is I didn't do enough. It was very, very easy for me to come home from work, get on the computer, and essentially continue to live my normal American life through the internet and not go out at all. That is my greatest regret uh, in my time in the JET program, is not taking more advantage of my time there. And it's easy. It's really, really easy to just kind of want to fade out. Especially when you get like culture exhaustion, like there's nothing familiar around you and you just kind of want to go back to that and, and feel, especially when you're in such a, a opposed sort of culture uh, like Japan coming from an American specifically, uh, so much of social interactions in one are the complete opposite of what, of, of what they are here. So it can get really exhausting and it does make you yearn for home a whole lot. Okay, next one. How are American culture or stereotypes currently seen abroad? How has it changed? The podcast Trash Taste, good boys by the way, generally claims that though they love America, Americans are weird. I think it would be interesting if you would be on the show and do an America episode. When COVID's over, when I can internationally travel again, and if the boys want me around, if they want me for one podcast, couple podcasts, whatever, I'm ready. I know Joey. I know Joey exceptionally well. I have yet to meet Gart. I have met uh, Sea Dog once. 
And that was a good experience. Uh, so he knows me at least. But one day. One day we'll, we'll, we'll see if that can happen. That's, that's, that ball is in their court. I've already told them I'd be down for it. Anywho. So the thing is, is that Japan's take on people from the United States or abroad in general, it really does vary from person to person. It's like, if you were to ask every American in existence, you know, what did they think of Japan? You're going to get a lot of varied answers all over the place. You're going to get people who really, really like it like me. A lot of people who really, really hate them like other people. There will be people who are indecisive. Some people like it a little. Some people dislike it a little. I mean... It's all over the place. Everyone has their own opinions. It's like, it's kind of impossible to have a whole consensus based around that because everyone's different and everyone has different experiences. As far as Japan loving uh, America, but thinking America's weird, I don't think Japan in the broadest spectrum loves America. I think Japan finds things interesting about America and the most interesting things they will integrate into their own culture. But the thing is, Japan loves America's pop culture. Let's be real here. It is... It, you could see that all over the place. I remember in um, one of Nobita's videos, he talked about how Japanese really, really loved, I, I, I guess, the Hollywood lens, I suppose. <laughs> the thing is that I believe that if Japan really loved, loved America in its entirety, there would be a greater permeation of our culture into theirs, similar to how a lot of theirs has come into ours. I actually did my senior thesis in college uh, about this phenomena. I mean, as an example from that, one of the things that I, I have noticed over the last 10 years of, of writing that particular piece back in the early 2000s is that when manga first came to the US, it started from left to right and then quickly changed from right to left. I mean, you can't find a lot of manga these days that don't do that. So a very, very Japanese, well, a not American normality of reading, I suppose, <laughs> has been integrated into our society in a very big way. I don't know how much so the other way around. I mean, I've seen Japanese written from left to right a whole lot, so maybe that is a bad example. But what I'm saying is that I'm seeing more about Japan permeating over here than the other way around. Next question. Why does Japan seem to be afraid of individuality? Because Japan isn't afraid of it, it's just never been a part of their culture. That's like asking, why are Americans afraid of homogenized behavior? It's who we are. It's how we came together as a society. It's how we continue to thrive as a society. As a society. Uh, there's not fear in here. It's just, that's just not what they do. Okay, next question. What's a memorable meal that you had during your time in Japan? Oh boy. Uh, I'm not gonna name names here, but there is an old college friend who was studying abroad uh, at my college. And I was able to, to meet back up with him when I was working abroad. And uh, I was able to go to Osaka with him. I was able to meet his family. Uh, I was able to go to Kyoto with his family. That was freaking cool. Wonderful, wonderful people. I remember they took me out to a sashimi dinner. I will never freaking forget. I will try to dig the pictures out if I have them. I'm sorry if they're low quality. But it was absolutely delectable. It's like all of the sashimi was just on like this boat of ice. It was so freaking cool. And I, I, I guess that was just one of the most memorable. Uh, I also had a dinner with a team teacher and my mother who came to visit from, from the US. And that was a truly interesting experience because my parents always loved to pick on me when I was younger for being a picky eater. And now I eat, I eat a diverse palette of things that they won't even touch. Which, mom, dad, if you're watching, I'm sorry, but it's true. <laughs> okay, next one. If you had the chance to redo your first time teaching in Japan, what would you have done differently and why? Like I said, I would have gone out more. So much freaking more. I would have gotten more involved, I think, with uh, some of the clubs. I was actually a part of a, a, a part of a club when I was teaching abroad. I was actually a part of the badminton team. Well, more like a sort of weird side coach that just helped with practice or something like that. But I mean, I would have done more stuff like that. I would have gotten more involved with their culture days, with, with their bunkasais, uh, with, with taikasai, with their sports festivals. I would have done way more with that. Uh, one of the problems that I did face going in is that I wanted to do too much and I was starting to overstep boundaries and I had to cut back, but I didn't know how far I was to cut back. I don't know. Maybe give my kids more one-on-one -on -one time. I I feel like I did more for my kids outside the classroom than I did in. Uh, more on that hopefully in a later video, but yeah, that's, that's definitely what I would have done differently. Okay, next question. Are there any Japanese exclusive content or media that you wish other parts of the world could view or get localized? 
Oh boy! So here's the thing. I know that round one exists in all different parts of the United States, at least, you know, for what I know. There are a lot of games in round one of Japan that we will never see here. That's kind of a shame because they're very, like, it blows my mind at how creative a lot of Japanese game centers get when it comes to how different games are played. Because you've got like the candy cabinet, you've got like the joystick and the button kind of games, but then you've got games that, that involve stuff like this. <laughs> so, I'll try and put up some footage when I can. When I was living abroad, um, Kantai Collection, Kankore, was really, really big. I kind of liked it. I wasn't super big into it. But anyway, the way that this worked is that this is a game that you kind of sat down at, and you would have all these different cards of all these different girls. And within each card, they had a stat block. And when you use them, they would level up, uh, they would get experience, things like that. But what you do is that you would take each card and you would like place it on a certain part of the machine itself. That loaded them in. And then the game itself was like this odd sort of third person fast paced naval battle thing where you would like hit one button for one weapon, and another button for another weapon, and you had this big old like helm that you would have to spin uh, to move them left or right. It was actually a lot of fun. I never could get really, really big into Japan's freaking card games, but that one was really fun. I will say too, there was a version of Left 4 Dead that had the weirdest controls I've ever seen. It was like a mouse with like 27 different buttons and this weird sort of like hand grip thing. Never played it, I was too afraid to, but I mean, it was Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead was really popular at that time. I wish I would have played it, but it's got a weird controller. Or there's a uh, another sort of giant robot game that I was able to experience one of the last times I was in Japan called Star Wing Paradox. I have no idea what the name means. Uh, I'll try to throw up some pictures and video footage if I can, but this game was dope. Uh, it had a chair that would like rock around and all this other stuff. You had multiple sets of buttons and controls going down the side and it actually felt like controlling a giant robot. I'll, again, I'll put more, uh, more footage up and pictures if I can, but it was really, really freaking cool. But I know why we don't have those kind of games over here, because those kind of games are going to be really, really hard to replace, at least for parts. And once they're broken, they're probably not going to be used anymore. I hate to say it, y'all. We're not very careful about arcade cabinets and, and game machines like that. I've seen parents let kids run around and just like smack the crap out of machines and not pay attention to that. I've seen people spill stuff on expensive machines. It it actually really, really aggravates me and angers me to no end because of, well, we're just lazy. Sorry, I've seen it too much. <laughs> I, know, I, I know exactly why we don't have games like that. And that's the reason why. Okay, next question. What are some of your favorite historical places you've been to? <sighs> it's like Pokemon. I've I've been to too many or I know too many. Uh, let me just list some off that I have written down over here. So, uh, I've been to Iga Ueno Jo or the White Phoenix Castle. You know, Japanese castles are always super nice. The Iga Ninja Museum. I mean, that place is heaven for me. I don't think I have to explain. For any of my longtime viewers on my other channel, I don't think I have to explain why. I've been to Nagoya Castle, and you would think that maybe that would be like just one kind of semi big building. No, it's the whole grounds. And they've got a museum, multi floor museum built into it, which is absolutely crazy. I've been to Mount Takao, uh, which is really, really big on Tengu. That was a really, really cool historical place. Uh, I did a video on the other channel, very similar to the content that I do here. I'll try and put something up over here. Go check that out again. I might actually re-upload that video over here. It's definitely more appropriate over here. And then finally, I've been to the burial site of Taira no Masakado. That will be its own video. Boy, howdy, if you ever wanted to feel uncomfortable, that's a place. <laughs> well, anyway, I I've been to a lot of different places in Japan, and like I said, I there's so many videos that I need to do because I've been to so many places, so I guess I'll get on it. Okay, this is a good one. What is your favorite Japanese folklore or myth and why? Two really spring to mind when I saw this question. First one, the tale of Isun Boshi, the one-inch boy. A tale of someone who's taken very, very lightly, but is triumphant due to his tenacity and bravery and quick thinking, and uh, never believing that his stature was a handicap. And then there's another one that I am actually going to do a separate video on because Despite being a children's story, this hit home really hard for me. The story at Naita Aka Oni, or The Crying Red Oni. Uh, like I said, it's another video I do want to make. Go read it yourself. You might actually understand why it may have hit really, really hard for me. Uh, I don't want to spoil that here, but it's... Again, despite being a simple kid's story... I'll just explain in the video. 
Okay, let's keep it going. Uh, have you been to a lot of yokai related tourist attractions in Japan like shrines and museums? If so, what would you recommend visiting? First and foremost, if you are in the Tokyo area, go to Chofu and go to the Kitaro Chaya. Uh, it's near Jindaiji Temple. If you've seen the most recent Gegege no Kitaro episodes, I think in like 2017, 18, something like that, uh, you see that temple. But basically, this place, it's like one part sort of cute little, little tea and snack shop, and one part sort of museum to Mizuki Shigeru who is the creator of Gegege no Kitaro, and an absolute pioneer when it comes to yokai. Again, I'll, I'll have pictures and videos and stuff going all around in here, but that is definitely a yokai hub. That is like a yokai enthusiast dream. I would, I would hesitate to call it the mecca, <laughs> but it's one of the great places I would suggest. One other would be Sol Genji Temple, aka Kapadera. You can find it uh, on Kapabashi, which is like... Weirdly enough, it, it, Kapabashi is a street that sells mostly like kitchen utensils or like restaurant goods, things like that. But then you've got Kapadera, which again, other video all its own, I don't have time to explain it here. But it's basically a Buddhist temple that also has this little, I hesitate to call it a worship kind of area, but uh, it basically commemorates a good-natured Kappa that helped out the people. <sighs> again, it's it's too long, I, I'd have to do a complete other video for it, but that, Kapadera, go to Kapadera. And then, personally, I'm not sure if this is going to happen again, but I was able to go to Japan in August of 2019 for the Gegege no Kitaro exhibition in Ikebukuro. Again, another video I absolutely need to put together because there was a lot that went on. But basically what it was all about was kind of having this Hyaki Yagyo, or Night Parade of 100 Demons, sort of in the art style of Mizuki Shigeru, and it was it was just absolutely off the hook. I, I again, I, so many videos I need to get done. <laughs> in retrospect. Okay, I just looked at my recording time and I am well past 40 minutes, so I think I'm gonna wrap up with just one more question. Now, don't worry, I'm gonna keep doing more of these down the line because I've got more than enough material to work with. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who hangs out in the community tab on YouTube. So, let's end off with this. What are the biggest tourist traps you can think of besides maid cafes? Ha ha ha, I see what you did there. For those uh, in the rose tinted group, or maybe what is the proper shrine etiquette and how to pray correctly. There are so many tutorials online about how to pray correctly that I'm just gonna say go check those out. Uh, I think I at one point have talked about it before. I don't wanna get too into it here because that would take a lot of time. But I will say this, stay away from the all Japan package deal. I've had so many friends that are like, oh yeah, we're gonna start off in Hokkaido, and then we're gonna go all the way to Tokyo, and then we're gonna go to Osaka, and, and, and Kyoto. I, don't do that. Because you're only gonna, at most, you're gonna have a week. You're gonna be able to spend one day in these different locations, and you're gonna have no control over where you go, what you do, what time you do it. It is very much, it's what I would call a postcard journey or a postcard trip, wherein you're gonna get the exact same experience doing that particular package round trip than you would at looking at postcards. It's gonna be very fixed, it's gonna be very focused. Don't do that. I will say too that if you do something similar to that, you will suffer from shrine and temple exhaustion. Because especially when you get to Kyoto, you're gonna see a lot of shrines, you're gonna see a lot of temples, and they're all gonna start bleeding together. Uh, they're gonna start looking the same, they're all gonna start feeling the same, unless you actually go in and ask what the meaning and representation of each shrine and each, tem each temple is for, you're gonna get overwhelmed and it's all gonna bleed together. So, stay away from the postcard experience. What I would suggest, find one or two things that you really, really, really want to do, or find one or two places in Japan that you really, really, really want to go, and do that because then you have 100% control over what you're doing. You can spend more time in a place if you want to, or you can spend less time in a place if you want to. If you take one of these tour package trips, you don't have any control over that. In fact, I would say that the greatest adventure that you can have in Japan is go somewhere and get lost. I mean that, just go explore. That's where you're gonna have the best, all of the greatest stories that I have yet to tell in these particular videos are experiences where I just went somewhere. I, I, like, half the time I even know where I was going. And they turned into amazing, wonderful experiences. A lot of my friends in the JET program would actively hitchhike around their part of the country specifically for that reason. So, honestly, just, just go explore. Don't get a package deal. Just find one or two things that you want to do or places to go and then go do that. 
Anyway, thank you everyone so much. I can't believe I have talked to this long and only have gotten halfway through the 29 pages of questions that I currently have. Oh, it's a doozy. But anyway, thank you guys so much for all these questions. Uh, if you got more, please list them. I will try to round them up as much as I can. I've got to talk about other things. I know I've got to talk about Nobunaga. I've got to talk about the Yasuke anime. There are a lot of things that I still need to talk about. But I will periodically come back to these questions. And thank you so much for them. This has been enlightening. It's been fun. I love talking about this kind of stuff, as you can probably tell. So anyway, thank you everyone for watching. And until next time, this is Gaijin, signing out.